All right, it's time for one of the most anticipated White Tail Cribs episodes we've ever done. It is with Dan and Fault. We stopped with him in Wisconsin this past summer. We've kept it in our pocket until right now. We stopped by his taxidermist studio, and you get to hear all of his favorite stories from over the years. Check out all of his bucks in one spot. We hope you guys enjoy it. It was a lot of fun. And actually, part of the Exodus team is going to be hunting with the Beast Crew. This upcoming week, we're going to be sharing that hunt. You can check out the comments when it is available. So, anyhow, we hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get right into it. Here we go. Hey, how's it going? Come on in. This is Trudell Outdoor Adventures Taxidermy Studio and home of the Dan Infault Whitetail Crib. This is the Rome legend buck. This buck, half the town was hunting, even Jay was hunting it. I was hunting it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I had one run in with him the year before, and the timing of when he was coming across the road onto my side from the private land uh, onto the public, the timing was that he would do that right at pre-rut at, at the end of October. And I just sat back and watched the rub line that comes out of the main bedding area. It's like a primary bedding area that's right up against the doe bedding. Okay. When that, when that bedding area got on fire and the uh, rub line opened up and all the rubs were this high, I knew he was in there. And then I started hearing rumors around town about people seeing him on the public land and everybody talking about they're gonna get him. And I went over there and the whole parking lot is full of cars. <laughs> and I get out there and he's got a scrape line going from the pri private land in, you know, and I get back there and I gotta go past like three or four guys. And one of them's only like 300 yards from 400 yards from where I'm gonna hunt. Oh, and he's wow. like, hey, hey, and I know he's not going to kill that deer. He's <laughs> on the edge of an open field. So I just went around him and went back there and I set up and I figured that that buck would be in this little bedding area that had like 20 beds in it. But every time there's something huge over there and especially in pre-rut, that's exactly where it beds every time. <laughs> and I'm thinking with the wind the way it was, he'd be in the one end, he'd be in this one bed. And I'm staring at it when he stands up out of it and comes in. It was, it's a really cool hunt. And I mean, that's... That's a satisfaction you can't get hunting over a food plot or you know, doing a drive or something like that. Yep. When you, out of that whole forest, pick the spot he's gonna be and the tree you need to be in. And what's unique about that too, is when I shot that buck, it was closing time. He got up a half an hour or hour before closing, but by the time he closed that 75 yards, it was closed up. Those hour. guys two, 300 yards back didn't have a chance. No. No way. So that was a pretty special hunt. <laughs> <laughs> the one on the far end there, that one's real special to me. That buck, I shot that buck in 89, and it was one of my first really big bucks. And that buck I hunted for three years, and I got sheds from him from three years. I got sheds from two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, and then when I shot him at five. And he just got bigger and bigger every year, obviously. The brows really shot up that last year. The shed antlers from the year before, the brows were only this big, but the, almost the same rack just small, smaller brows. That one right here, this is another opening day buck, and that's probably from around, uh, somewhere right around 1990. I was watching that one glassing him, and ended up shooting him, and he, he, uh, he's missing the brow on one side, and he's missing the G4 on the other. Mm -hmm. So he scores as a six pointer and still makes Pope and Young. Wow. As a six. This one's kind of a cool buck here. Um, that one I, uh, I was glassing him all summer, and uh, I put one of my buddies on him, and uh, he missed him and spooked him. And then I put another one of my buddies on him. He moves wrong or something and spooked it. And about a week later, I came onto him again and saw him going through a field coming from a bedding area. And I just thought, well, I'm going to take him. And I went and set up on him. And he came uh, right underneath my tree, and he, I was expecting him to veer off on a trail, and he never veered. And he went straight underneath me, and I was following him with the bowl. And when he went straight down, I shot, and he was really speed walking. And as I released, a limb came in my way that I didn't see, and I hit the limb. And my arrow went like this through the sky and was just like tumbling. And going sideways, it hit him about this far in from the tail, and blood almost hit me in the stand. It severed the artery going down his leg. And it was faster than a heart kill. He took two jumps, didn't even know he was hit. The arrow only went in this far. 
And he was standing there with blood geysering out of him. You could see it from the tree. I wish I had that one on film. <laughs> but he was standing there, also just boom, hits the ground. I was like, what just happened? <laughs> that buck there, um, I shot that a long time ago, uh, probably back in the 80s. Don't want the little velvet antler hanging down. I shot him because of the velvet antler, because I really thought that was cool. And I was hunting with another guy, and that guy was in a hurry to get home. And I told him I shot this buck, and he's uh, going to help me track it, and he was in a hurry. And where I hit it, um, I took a really long shot. It was like 40 or 45 yards. And I hit it right behind the shoulder, and it was broadside, but it started to spin on the release of the arrow. And the arrow had gone in and come out of its neck. It actually missed all the vitals and just cut the artery a little bit. But there was blood sprayed everywhere for about 100 yards, and then there laid the buck. Wow. And when we got over to it, it was on the side of this ridge. And uh, the blood stopped completely at the buck. But I noticed right away its eyes were closed. And I'm looking close, and I can see the chest rising. And I'm like, that buck's still alive. And my buddy's like, it's not alive. Let's just get it out of here. And he, he's just, I'm like, I got to go back and get an arrow. Because my bow was still hanging by my stand. <laughs> and he's like, let's just get out of here. And he was like, being a pain. You know, not letting me have my moment. So I go back and I get my, my, uh, my bow and I come back and ended up shooting him in the, and when I did, it just jumped to life. And he was standing directly in front of it and I told him, get out of the way, and he didn't. And it ran him over and knocked him down the ridge and covered him with blood, so it was great. <laughs> <laughs> so that was worthy of mounting. <laughs> yeah. This is one of my favorite bucks here, um, if not the favorite. Um, that buck, I watched him all summer from a parking lot that was a major parking lot on a public land. And he was right next to the parking lot bedding and he'd always come out of this little thick stuff um, and cross this little ditch and then cross the road. And nobody was noticing him except for me. And I kept watching him and watching him. And then uh, he was always with this other buck that was like about 140 class. Not always, but one time the 40, 140 would come out then he'd come out and you know sometimes he wouldn't show. But I had it down to when I thought he was there and I moved in for the kill. And uh, the first one in was the 140 inch buck and I had to contemplate whether or not to kill it. And uh, I let him go. And when he was walking away, I was still watching him off in the distance going to cross the road when that little ditch that was kind of flooded at the time, I saw ripples in it out of the corner of my eye and I turned and he's standing there coming right at me. And I was in a willow tree this high off the ground laying there and he's coming right at me. And it looked like he was staring at me, you know, like looking right into my eyes. He got to about where you are, like six paces. And uh, then he turned broadside and went over to a scrape that was under a branch in the willow. Started working that and I shot him right there. It was pretty cool. He took two jumps, stood there, looked around and just fell with a thud. (laughs) That buck uh, bottomed out a 300 pound scale dressed. We got him off, by the time we got him off the ground, the scale was completely locked down. So we don't know what he weighed, that he was huge. The mount doesn't do it justice for the body Mm -hmm. size it had. The albino doe is pretty cool. Uh, we could only shoot albinos for a short period of time yep. in Wisconsin. Um, they legalized it, now they closed it again. And while it was legal, I knew about this deer. And I went after it, and one day I shot over its back and missed it. And then uh, another day I took a, an outdoor rider hunter hunting and had kind of given up on it. And it walked past the outdoor rider. Oh, really? And he wouldn't shoot it. He wouldn't shoot an albino. And then uh, the next year... I finally got it to come walking out to me next to this bedding area, and I shot it at point blank. I shot it as it was looking at me in the tree. Nice. It uh, spotted me. But uh, uh, the year after that, I was hunting with my buddy Dave. We had an albino buck come out between us and come walking right towards me, and then it just abruptly turned and walked to him, and he shot it. And if it would have came to me, I'd be the only person in Wisconsin to shoot two with a bow. Oh, wow. That's it right there. That's Dave's buck. Right there. I know it's kind of scrawny, but it's two-year-old. The one next to Dave's buck, this is the, um, the buck I shot two years ago in January um, where I found its big tracks and then uh, figured it out, mapped out the area and went in and ended up getting them. Yeah, that's it's another op- opening day, d- day buck. That's, uh, um, he was bedded down in a little swamp. Um, that buck I had no history of with it, it whatsoever. He just got up and came in. And wow. Never saw him before. This buck over here, um, I don't know if you can see the rack very well, in that, but that buck, uh, that's my highest scoring buck. Uh, he scores in the upper 180s, gross, right under 180 net. And uh, 
I've got one shed antler from that buck. I hunted that buck for like three years. And the shed I found right in his bed, I shot him in that bed, the same bed I found the shed in. Um, in his last uh, couple years that I was hunting him, he always bedded when it was a westerly wind, which was most of the time under this willow that was sweeping over in some grass in a low swampy area. And you couldn't get near him because everything else was open. There was no trees or anything. There wasn't a Smart. scrape or rub within 100 yards of that bed. And he would be bedded there all the time. And then in uh, uh, the end of January, I picked up a shed antler in that, that bed. And the next year, I was watching him bed there on a regular basis, going in and out of there, and some other bucks when he wasn't there. And it was getting to be so regular that I knew he was there, but he would get up and he'd move 100 yards in daylight and it'd be too dark to shoot. And there was no trees around. And it was all canary grass, so it was just driving me crazy. And it was set up with a, um, that west wind. You'd come in down this uh, dirt road. If you stepped off that dirt road, he, he would get buggy. But people would walk past him all the time. So I, one day I went in there and I, I walked on the road and I, I see his tracks going across some snow. So I, I walk off the trail like 20 yards looking at his tracks, looking over towards the tree where he beds. I turn around, come back, and I'm trying to contemplate a setup. But ultimately I just thought, no, I'm just going to go back and watch and see what happens and see if he moves far enough. He walks out like he always does and gets to where I walk 20 yards from that trail and just buggers out of there, just runs out of there. If I walk on the dirt road, he's okay. But you get that scent off that dirt road where you don't belong and he'd freak out. So then on Thanksgiving day, I was, I was waiting for a, a wind switch. Okay. I knew he wouldn't go cross country, but I was thinking I could sneak in on him on a wind switch. Yep. And our gun season is, is uh, Thanksgiving week. And on Thanksgiving day, right in midday, the wind switch from west to east and I said I gotta go get this buck and my whole family was mad because we're having a big celebration and I just I got my shotgun I'm like I'll be back I'll be back I'll be back yeah. and uh, I went out there and there's a little patch of cattails between the logging road or the dirt road and the bed and I got on that dirt road in line with that bed with the cattails and I crawled up to those cattails and I bungeed the back the gun to my back and there was the water was like this deep in the grass and it was frozen and I had to just kind of break the ice and I went through I got soaked and I, I get to those cattails and I never had you know the courage to do that yeah you know and especially with a bow but I did it with a shotgun right right but I get to those cattails and I get that gun off my back and stuff and you're half thinking he's not going to be there you know and I rise up out of, out of the, this little patch and the thing's 20 yards from me sitting in his bed looking at me like this broadside and I shot it right in the heart <laughs> and if it would have been a bow, I would have shot it with a bow, but I never had the courage to do that. Wow. You know, if I would have had the courage, I could have did it with a bow. Yeah. But, uh, that's really, cool. yeah, he just jumped out of his bed and fell a few feet from it. But this buck here is the, um, I shot that on private land, but that was really cool because, uh, it came into a water hole. I, I don't know if you've seen the footage, but, uh, I shot the thing while it was drinking water and it jumped way up in the air. And did a cannonball into the pond <laughs> and then over the hill. Nice. I always just, uh, that one's always special to me because I remember that view and I, actually I get to watch it all the time because I got it on video. But So this one, uh, I was glassing him a lot, shining, which is legal in Wisconsin, and seeing him quite a bit in certain fields. Mm -hmm. And um, I lost track of him, couldn't find him. And I had one day when, when, I, did, when I did figure out where he was, and he came out of his bedding too late and walked underneath me, but it was too dark to shoot. But you could just see the rack floating underneath me, and I just had to let him go. Uh -huh. And then the next day, he didn't show, you know. Um, and then I lost track of him, probably because I went in there and, and boogered up the butt bedding area trying to hunt him. So I'm looking for him, looking for him, and a buddy calls me up, and he says, uh, hey, you know that real wide buck you, you, you've been talking about? I says, yeah. He says, well, it's showing up on these fields over blah, blah, blah. I was like two miles from where I was hunting, but I could go to. You know, it was a place I could hunt. So I went over there and shined, and sure enough, saw him. And then set up in there and ended up shooting him right off the bat on, wow. the, on the next setup. I knew the area. I just had to know that he was over there. I didn't think he moved that far. It's, it's surprising how far these deer will travel sometimes. Sure. That buck up here, um, the second one from the right, the double main beam one, that's kind of cool. Um, that buck, I had just started a new job. The boss's kid came out hunting with me, wanted yeah. to hunt with me. And I put him on this tree line, and it was a real open area. And I was down in this low area, and it was peak rut. And this is way back, this is way back in the 80s. And uh, I hit two antlers together. 
and I see the thing running from me, it's running from him. <laughs> well, here, he, from his view, he's watching this buck walk up to him, I start rattling and it runs away from him to, oh. to me, right? So it runs all the way across this field and comes right underneath me. And I was in a willow tree only this high up, right in the crotch, because it was real open, that's all there was, was those crazy trees. Yeah. And I shoot the thing at point blank and he's moving so fast that I hit him in the liver. Oh. And he turns around and he runs back towards this guy and gets to about 40 yards from him and beds down in this field. I go across the field and he's in his tree going like this, like I can't see the buck's rack sticking up. It was an alfalfa field, you couldn't miss it. Right. And I get to about 30 yards from it and I take a shot. And it starts looking around and I think it knew he was there and I was there because it was like looking at both of us. Yeah. And it mm-hmm. takes off running and hits this brush pile <laughs> and ends up dying. And, we go down there and, get, and that guy was so mad at me. Because he thought I watched the deer walk out by him and I called it from him. And then he thought I was going to push it to him to shoot. And I went up there and shot it in front of him. (laughs) I didn't keep that job very long. He made more of the story than it was. That's pretty good. But it it was a fun buck. Dan, I sure do thank you for letting me have uh, these animals in my shop here. Because your whitetail crib is uh, a boon to my business. It's been really nice having them they make great displays and people come in and they they point at them and we have lots of fun discussions about them and sure do appreciate having them here at our, our taxidermy studio well, i like you having them here they're not at my house getting uh full of cat hair <laughs> appreciate good. it thanks dan